Okay, if I can get everyone to take their seats and we'll get going. Great. So, uh, good evening and welcome everyone. I'm Stanley Brown. I'm the Dean of the Dalai Lama School of Public Health. Uh, and I've got just a few very pleasant duties up here tonight. Um, the first is, to, of course, to welcome you all, to welcome you here to Victoria Chapel. Uh, there'll be a few of us older people who will appear to have a halo. Uh, it's not the setting, it's not the setting or the uh, sacred nature of this place, it's just balding and a bit of reflected light. So if the show's up in pictures, there's, there's nothing to take a mess about that. Look, uh, more, perhaps much more importantly, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto sits. Uh, for thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of Indigenous peoples. Uh, it's still home to Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we're privileged and grateful uh, to have the opportunity to work here. Now, uh, one quick housekeeping item. Uh, for anyone who's younger than me who may be tweeting, the hashtags tonight are hashtag Bohm Lecture and hashtag Aunt Health. Uh, this lecture is being webcasted live and will be available on our website after the event. So, uh, just a couple things to keep in note. Um, what I want to do now, though, is sketch why this is an important lecture for us, uh, why it reflects uh, the nature of our community at the school, uh, and do the very pleasant duties of introducing our keynote uh, and introducing Greg Marshallton. So this is our seventh leadership lecture series. It's the Bohm Leadership Lecture Series. I'd like to thank Les Bohm, uh, whose generosity has made this series possible. I, as a dean, I spend a lot of time uh, thanking people for donations and thanking people for their gifts to the school and the way that they actually contribute to the whole community around us. Uh, in this case, I, I won't thank Les for his donation. Uh, what I'll do is I'll thank him for his vision uh, because this whole enterprise is really a function of an idea that he's had and he's cultivated about how the school can engage a wider and wider community of people around it and really help uh, elevate what we're doing. And so thanks, Les, very much for that. Um, look, as we build on our tradition of health system innovation, these sort of talks give us a chance to kind of look at what Canada might think about, uh, to explore options for what might work for us here by bringing experts to us, and then getting the chance to kind of comment and think and engage in sort of a reflective moment. And so tonight's lecture will explore how Ireland's policy roadmap, designed by Stephen Thomas, is delivering whole system reform and universal health care. Is a plan that has five components, and I won't steal the whole talk uh, for you here. Uh, <laughs> although it's an interesting thing, I might just talk here for about 40 minutes. Um, population health, entitlements, integrated care, funding, and making sure that you've got effective implementation. And although we're talking about the Irish system, these are things that are near and dear to our own heart and things that we value here as well. And so obviously some lessons for us. It's also, I think, good for us to kind of look beyond our borders. Often we have an idea that everything has to be made in Canada or made in Ontario, and we lose the opportunity to kind of think about what the examples from elsewhere do to challenge our own thinking and help us move along. Uh, you know, you hear from Stephen tonight, uh, but you'll also hear from other people. We've got the, uh, my chair of the Ontario Premier's uh, Council for Improving Healthcare and Ending Hallway Medicine, uh, Ruben Devlin, someone I've worked with for two decades now. I think in different ways, uh, in hallway, in improving healthcare across Ontario. Uh, we've got the founding fellow in public policy from the Monk School, and a long time ago, a member of our faculty as well, which I'm very proud of. Uh, and the chair of the Ontario Ministers, uh, health, uh, Ontario Ministers of Health Patient and Family Advisory Council. Uh, Greg will introduce everyone in a few minutes. But let me now actually uh, introduce Greg, who will be taking over very shortly from me. Uh, I think. Uh, with people like Greg, I often say that you know, he needs no introduction, and if you need his introduction, that's your problem, not his. It's true with Greg. Uh, he's had a long and distinguished career in public service and in academia. He started the North American Observatory uh, here at the Dalai Lama School of Public Health. It's already providing a lot of valuable policy advice into people. He was the chair of the uh, Romano Commission, the Commission on the Future of Healthcare in Canada. He's been a deputy minister in Saskatchewan. He's been a lawyer any number of other things that I might call attention to. I got a little bit of a moment of personal pride, though. Uh, Greg was one of the first people we were able to recruit to the school in a really kind of high-profile role when I was able to come on board. Uh, and we're grateful that we're able to lure you away from Saskatchewan. Being originally a Prairie Boy myself, I know that's no mean feat, so we're glad you're here. Now, let me introduce our keynote speaker, Stephen Thomas. So he's the director of the Center for Health Policy and Management at Trinity College, Dublin. He's authored more than 60 publications, he's developed multiple health policies, and one that actually includes free general practice for those under six and those under 70. 
Uh, Stephen's one of these nice people who you can trace very clear lines between scholarship and impact, which is something that we really try to emulate at the school, so it's a, a real treat to welcome you here. He brings a unique global perspective, more than 20 years of experience in health economics research and policy, long-term postings in South Africa, Bangladesh, and Uganda, and perhaps after he's been charmed by our lovely winter weather here, we'll have him in Canada for a while too. Please welcome Stephen Thomas. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, uh, yes, I, I do find your winter weather incredibly charming. Um, I was walking up here and, and I thought I was going to resemble a human uh, popsicle, I think the, the, the phrase is. And I was actually in Lisbon um, uh, two weeks ago and it was 23 degrees and I got sunburned. So uh, compared to here where I have wind chill. So anyway, it's, um, it's lovely to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely privileged and, uh, and I feel very humbled to be able to give this uh, address. Uh, today to such an august um, uh, company. Um, and, but I think it's really important that we, we discuss some of these issues uh, uh, around policy and reform, and particularly the role that evidence can play uh, in that setting. And I want to be talking uh, about the, uh, the launch care system today. If I can just move that on. There we go. Uh, transforming health systems towards universal health care. And the case of what's called launch care in Ireland. Uh, and this is really a 10-year plan which is trying to change the Irish healthcare system, which has been out of line with a lot of European healthcare systems in, in being a long way away from universal healthcare to one that we can be genuinely proud of. And uh, the definition of genuinely proud of for any Irish audience is better than the UK. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start off at, yeah, I'm glad you, you enjoyed that one. Um, I'm going to start off with uh, thinking just a, li a little bit about, about the scope of what we're going to do. So I'll give you some context of the, the state of, of, of Ireland, um, Irish healthcare, Irish politics. Now, I'm going a little bit out of my comfort zone here, so you're going to have to humor me. Uh, I'm an economist by background. I'm not a political scientist. So I'm going to venture into, that, into, the, into those dark arts for a few minutes in the middle, uh, and um, I'll probably, hopefully, I emerge unscathed, but we'll see. Uh, I'm going to then talk about the actual launch care policy, uh, the, uh, the process by which it was designed and the actors, because that's quite interesting, and then, of course, the technical design. And then I'm going to move off to thinking about what I call the cement mixer of implementation, the slow churn, and where we are right now with that before giving you some final reflections. Uh, and just to say, um, uh, you, you may not be able to pronounce this word, launch care. Uh, it, it's actually the word that we, uh, slauncha is, is, is good health, uh, and it's what you say when you have a drink. Okay, so you say slauncha. Okay, so it, funnily enough, you know, isn't, it, isn't that very Irish? The, 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 <laughs> the fact that you'd have sort of alcoholic cheers and good health as the same term. Uh, and if anyone can't get it, we'll, we can have some drinks afterwards and we can practice there, okay? Sounds good. Okay. So, the uh, Irish healthcare system is basically what I call a malfunctioning beverage system. So, uh, it, uh, as you can see here with the, 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 the pie chart there, it's about 69%, 70% government funding, which is doing the driving of the, of the health system. But it doesn't work like a normal health system, a normal be beverage system, because it doesn't really give you any entitlements to anything. <coughs> Uh, and that's where the, the, the system breaks down. We have extremely long waiting lists, probably some of the longest waiting lists in the OECD. So there were ministerial targets for 18 months and 15 months to get an inpatient appointment, and they've now been dropped. So that's how extreme the waiting lists are. And off the back of that then, there's very much a two-tier care system where if you can get private insurance, and approximately 45% of the population have private in health insurance, then you can get faster access into uh, often what is the public health care system, although it may be a private bed in the public health care system. So it's a very, a very divided, um, uh, if you like, two-tier two -tier care uh, system. Uh, so we're quite a long way away from universal health care. We also have market price for GP uh, payments. So to go and see my GP, most people, have to pay 50 or 60 euros just to get in the door. And that's before I get any, any drugs. Now, 
on the other side, uh, the, the Irish system is, has a safety net, so that's basically what's called the, the medical card, and if you're below a certain means a threshold, or if you're over a certain age, you get free care, you get free GP care, you get free drugs, you get free admission to hospital. So it works quite well for you, although it is quite a narrow basket of care that, that's covered. It doesn't cover, so, sorry, the, all of the social care uh, aspects, and there's some other charges that it doesn't cover, but it, it's, it, it's not bad uh, as a safety net. But we also do have quite high levels of unmet need because there are quite a few co-payments that are required through the system for people to pay. And, and uh, evidence shows that rather than spending money, people would rather go without or are forced to go without because of budgetary uh, c constraints. So that gives you a general picture of the Irish healthcare system. So we're quite a long way away from universal healthcare. On top of that, we had a very difficult, complex crisis from 2007, uh, 2008 onwards, where the economy uh, was in real trouble. We had our unemployment rate go up from 4.6% to 14% uh, in very uh, short order. Uh, our, our, our government debt, which was very low at 25%, shot up to about 120%. Our government deficit reached an astonishing 30%. So that's the amount of money the government is spending rather than receiving. It was a very severe crisis, and we had about six austerity budgets. So our, our, our austerity was long, and it was painful. Uh, and it was difficult coping with that. Uh, so we had uh, public sector wage cuts, tax increases, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the day, we had a bailout. We, were, we joined the uh, esteemed ranks of countries who'd been bailed out by the IMF. Who would have thought? So we were one of the, uh, one of the pigs. That's uh, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. We were bailed out by the Troika of the European Union, the U European Central Bank, and the IMF. So that was, these were not happy days. Um, was it all bad? That's the interesting thing. Uh, in some ways, it was bad, but it wasn't all bad. Uh, and it provides us with an interesting context to think about how we move towards universal he health care, which I'm going to do just now. We see here on the, on the right our, our, our e expenditure uh, on health care, our nominal and our real expenditure uh, over time. And you can see the dip from the, the, the crisis. But what's interesting is the massive expansion before. Uh, and so in some ways, we were, we were a little bit overweight when we went into the uh, crisis. We'd shoved a lot of money into the health s uh, system. And maybe it's easier to undergo such an, an austerity and such a crisis if you're a bit flabby to start with. So we had to go on a diet. It wasn't pleasant. But we actually had some things that we could cut and some savings that we could make, which was interesting. So, um, so I'm looking here at some of the system resourcing indicators uh, and acute uh, activity, um, indexing it to, two th to 2008 uh, at a value of 1. And what we can see uh, on the bottom is the blue line is the, is, the, is, is the budget, and the red line is the staff. You can see quite strong decreases in that. And yet, the system actually didn't manage too badly to start off with. We can see the purple line, which is day, ca day case discharges. So there was an immediate switch from, from the, with the, the hospital sector to say, actually, we can do this differently. If we change a lot of our, our services to day cases, we can make some uh, efficiency savings. We can adapt to this quite well. Uh, and that certainly uh, started there. Uh, and even with our uh, inpatient discharges, it didn't suffer too badly. Our length of stay did not go up. So suddenly the hospitals found that they had a bit of room for maneuver. And actually, in some ways, a short, sharp shock to the system may actually be a bit of a wake-up call. I think the problem gets when the austerity continues and continues and then demotivation get, um, kicks in, uh, the actual room for maneuver starts to run out. The low-hanging fruit has all been used up. Uh, and what we saw, uh, particularly sort of from 2014 onwards, was the system starting to get more, uh, more clogged up, beds being taken out, staffing not being there, and the system starting to, to become more and more dysfunctional. And this is particularly shown here by our emergency admissions in the, in the turquoise, which shot up through the roof. And a lot of that was frail, older people who no longer had proper primary and community care. And they were ending up in the, in the EDs. And that's a current problem that we have. So we started off 
doing some adaptation, and then we ran into, into trouble. Uh, another perhaps shocking uh, statistic, uh, and we published this uh, in, in, in The Lancet, was the actual uh, amount of cost shifting that went from the government onto households. So government couldn't cope, they were looking for cuts, uh, they had to make cuts uh, to sort of balance the, the, the budget, and one way they did that was by, uh, was by pushing back some of the charges onto households. And this chart here shows the additional amount that was pushed back onto households um, from 2008 to 2014. It's around 600 million, so that was approximately 130 uh, euros per person per year. For, for, for every um, member of the population. And of course that was targeted at the old and it was targeted at the sick. So not, not a clever policy there. So that was really uh, causing trouble. Uh, and we can see uh, items like the reduction of coverage of the medical card. So no longer did the over 70s get entitled to that. Uh, we can see prescription charges which were added in and particularly for those with medical cards. So the poorest sections of the population had prescription charges added to, to accessing healthcare, which was obviously particularly um, uh, anti, uh, anti universalist. We had increased inpatient charges and we had higher thresholds for drug reimbursements. You used to get re uh, reimbursed once you spent uh, over a certain amount. In a, in a month, it was around 80 to 100 euro. That shot up and al almost doubled. So the government was dealing with this, but it was pushing back onto households and making it very difficult for households to, to uh, afford uh, healthcare. At the same time, uh, the impact on acute waiting lists uh, went from bad to catastrophic. Uh, and we, we can see here on, on, on this chart our, our, our waiting lists uh, up to around 2012 were fairly static. And then as the system started to get dysfunctional, uh, even more dysfunctional, not only did the waiting list shoot up, but the number of long waits shot up too. Uh, so a system really in crisis at that stage. And so now I'm going to go into, in, into the politics bit, so you'll have to excuse me while I'm, I hash my way through this. Um, uh, come 2016, people were tired, they were fed up. They, the, 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 I mean, it takes a lot for Irish people to protest, but when medical cards are removed from the over 70s, that's what will get them going. So, uh, so there was lots of protesting, lots of uh, concern, and the general election came along in 2016, and the government parties lost out hugely, and particularly the minority Labour Party, who, who, who was um, propping up the, the sort of centre-right uh, party, got um, uh, a real kicking, got completely annihilated uh, at the polls. And what's interesting uh, about that uh, election, as in common with many other elections around the world, is that the main, the main parties l lost out hugely. As people looked for viable alternatives, they pushed away from the, the status quo. Uh, and the, 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 the two main parties that had been there since, uh, the, in effect, since the end of the Civil War in Ireland, about almost 100 years ago, had bet even between them less than 50% of the, the, the vote. There was a very fragmented left and there was a rise of a lot of, of independence. Fortunately, in Ireland, we haven't seen the rise of populism, which is great. Uh, we haven't had that, but nevertheless, the system was extremely uh, fragmented and we ended up with a, a, a minority government, even with various uh, co coalitions, a minority government which is only, uh, which is only held stable by a supply uh, and confidence uh, arrangement with the main opposition parties agreed not to vote against them in, uh, in key uh, finance votes um, and key, uh, key other um, uh, votes there. Um, and actually that's strangely enough been quite s uh, sustainable, so, so we're actually now three years on and that's still in place, which is you wouldn't have uh, expected that. So the, um, so the the political system then, we have a, a republic with a, a ceremonial pre president. We've got two houses, the Senate and the Doyle. As I said, we're dominated by two parties, but with a declining share. Uh, and, and we can see here the, 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 the sort of uh, the arc of the different parties. So the, the blue would be the Fine Gael currently uh, in government. The green would be the, the Fine Fáil. And then you can see on the, on the left hand, the, the very much the fragmented left. We have a proportional 
uh, representation, a kind of uh, single transferable vote, which is great fun. It means when you go into the election, I mean, I like this because I'm, I'm British, so I come from a, a first-past-the-post system, which is boring and usually hopeless, because if you're wrong, in the wrong place, it doesn't matter who you vote for. In Ireland, you really feel like you, this, is, this is democracy. This is Athenian democracy because you go in and you have a, a list of faces and you, have, and, you, and you go from one all the way down to 15. You order them. And then if, you're, if you get the, pick the right person, then uh, their, their overflow votes over the threshold get reallocated to, to the other candidates. So, so if, if you back the right horse, you can have your first, second, third, and fourth uh, votes all counting for, for something, which is great fun. The problem is it leads to quite fluid coalitions because um, uh, you, it is you know, proportionally representative, but therefore there's often not a strong government and therefore people have to try and seek and, and negotiate with each other, which can mean that the things that you voted for get immediately tossed out in the negotiations. So it's a sl strange kind of case of policy drift. But anyway, with, uh, as I say, since 2016, we've had this very much this minority government, and a lot of independents are in there, all demanding their own, bit and, uh, their own bits and pieces of, of, of the cake, if you like, pork barrel politics. Uh, and it, it is uh, perhaps amazing that the, that the system has survived as long as it, it, it has. And anyway, in the middle of this then, uh, we had a new minister, uh, Simon Harris, who uh, is of the ripe old age of 29. Now, there's, there's the, the, the challenge. And now um, the Ministry of, of Health is quite, is quite the portfolio for a 29-year-old, certainly makes me think. Um, and uh, he put into place a, uh, an Oroctus and a parliamentary all-party committee to develop a single long-term plan for healthcare over a 10 year period. But actually, that's the official story. What actually happened was this lady here, Deputy Roisin Shortall, who was a leader of one of the center left parties, had the idea of getting uh, an all party committee together. And she went round all the TDs and got a majority of them to say that they wanted it. And given the government was in a, was in a minority position, she said to the minister, look, a majority of TDs want that. Should we do it then? And so he felt a little bit coerced, but Actually, to, to, be, to be fair to him, he's taken it on and he's run with it and he's been extremely supportive. Perhaps he can see the value of actually making this push at this time, of making it a big legacy thing. And if you look at some of the international evidence around UHC, the legacy impact for, for politicians is not to be underestimated. Um, so, and, and, and anyway, in, in some ways, this, the, the weakness of the government had actually created what people termed new politics. So there was there's, there's been an era, an era of trying to be a little bit more, more consensual, a little bit less combative. Um, because normally what would happen is uh, a government would get in, they'd make a hash of health, and all the opposition would just throw rocks at them. And then they'd win the next election, and then it would be their turn to get rocks thrown at them, and the healthcare system didn't get sorted out. So people were tired of that political football thing, and they thought, well, maybe we just give it, if we all push together, maybe we can do something. And, and what's also interesting, I, d I think, and I think this is quite important, is that in the stipulation of the uh, Oroctus Committee Terms of Reference, there is a common statement of problems. And I think that, that can't be ignored. With wicked problems, it's often difficult to get an understanding of actually what you're, you're dealing with or getting agreement on what the, the problem to be solved is, uh, is. But here we have... Severe pressures on the system, unacceptable waiting times, poor outcomes relative to cost, and we need to establish a single tier system where patients are treated on the basis of health need rather than on ability to pay. So everyone agreed to that across the political uh, spectrum, which was great. So how did we, how did we do this? Well, uh, how did we work it? Well, actually, interestingly, this was the first time ever in the history of Irish state that there had been this attempt to develop consensus on health that was across parties. And it was definitely a political and not a technical process. And in that, I think, lies its, its, its beauty, but also some of its weakness. Because it, uh, in a sense, parts of government that would normally be doing this weren't necessarily empowered through this process. And we can talk more about that 
just now. So the, the, the committee was very much re reflecting that, that arc of, of, uh, of, of uh, parliamentary uh, members that I was showing you early, earlier. So it's a 50-50 centre-right to left representation. The chair was uh, Deputy Roisin Shorthall from the, uh, the Social Democrats. Uh, and and they, for about six months, they had they sought evidence. So they had 150 submissions from every stakeholder under the sun. They had 34 public presentations. They had masses of private sessions, and they were kind of drowning in 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 information. And then they started. Then they decided that we need to take a step back from that. Uh, they decided we need to be evidence based. And actually, normally a parliamentary committee works off the submissions. It takes the submissions as evidence which is an interesting definition of, of ev evidence and stakeholder p p positions. But this is the evidence. Maybe politically it is. But they said, no, 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 we actually want to think about what does, what does actually the research say. So they decided that they needed to run a series of workshops, which was quite brave of them. Uh, and they called us in to do that. We put together a proposal. They liked it. And, and we did a series of workshops to try and develop a common understanding of the problems and the options. This is the first time workshops have ever been used in this kind of setting, so it was new for the Oireachtas and, and, and for the civil service, so they were kind of nervous about how it would work, but it was really useful because we got to dialogue what the key issues were, and we got to dialogue what key principles we wanted to undergird the policy, and that was very useful, because when we came down the road later on, uh, we could come back to the eight principles that that w w we had as a way of helping us work through what we, what we could agree to. So for instance, one of the, the principles was we should only use public funds in the public interest. Sounds quite simple, but actually that proved to be quite an important point uh, later on. Uh, so we did that, we had, sorry, I'm bashing up too many arms, sorry. Um, we did that over uh, a couple of, uh, of months and then we got into five months of very intensive drafting and lots of negotiation, line by line, going through of all the points. All the political parties took it away and eventually hammered out this agreement. And, uh, and everybody, except for one uh, member of the committee, signed up to it. And that member of the committee was part of the anti-austerity alliance, which is pretty left-wing, really. So. They were saying, we like what's in here, but we want it more and we want it faster. That's fine. I'll live with that, I thought. That's okay. Uh, but other than that, we got political consensus uh, across the board. Um, right, let's look at the design aspects. Why is it tricky doing this? Well, at first, you think it's just about the financing and the access. But when you look at it more deeply, you actually realize that you're in actually quite a delicate balance between demand and supply, and the two must match. And if you're going to expand uh, free care, you need to make sure the system can respond to it. And you need to, be, you need to be very careful about your timing and phasing. So it's almost like um, not just building blocks of a system, but cogs in a wheel. So if you change one thing, you need to change everything. And I think it, that's how we sort of came at the whole issue of Solange Care of the, of the design process. And... Um, we can show it here, really. So we, we first of all focused on entitlements. We were going to give people an entitlement to care. Uh, and we were going to give, uh, which means uh, pretty much you know, low or no cost where possible. And we were going to get, give people an entitlement to care within a certain period of time, which would be legislated for and backed up with guarantees. Now, of course, you can't do that immediately. But the idea was that that would come uh, once the, the system uh, expands. So we, to get those entitlements across the line, you then need to back that up. So you need to think about, well, what are the, what's the resourcing patterns needed? What's the funding needed? And you need to think about what's the, what's the care system? What's the capacity of the system like? Can we expand the capacity of the system at the same time as, uh, so, so that it backs up those entitlements so that they become a reality? So it's thinking about a whole system approach where the whole thing matches together. So you have to think about a very careful phasing of how you expand each different component so, so the system isn't, isn't disconnected at, at any stage. And we also put a lot of thought into the whole implementation process. Uh, and the reason for that is that Ireland is extremely good at having brilliant policies which go absolutely nowhere. Uh, and you, I don't know whether you have that problem here. Maybe you don't. 
but I think it, it, it tends to be fairly common. Uh, and, and so we, we put a lot of thought into thinking what kind of implementation capacity is needed. Do we need an implementation office? How much money does it need? What kind of staffing does it need? What kind of authority does it need? And who should it, it report to? And one of the things, perhaps one of the most contentious things that we did is we said it should be situated in the Taoiseach's office, so that's the Prime Minister's office, not in the Department of Health. Now, I understand why that decision was made by the politicians, because th they, they didn't think the Department of Health were kind of up to it. Uh, and they thought if you put it in the, in the Prime Minister's office, they will have the power over finance to make it happen. But I think the message that was then sent to the Department of Health was not a particularly positive one, and that may well have, uh, have caused us trouble later down the line, when, of course, the plan was actually situated in the Department of Health. So anyway, we'll come back to that. Um, okay, so what's in the report? So uh, with a quite a big focus on population health, we have a rapidly aging population. Uh, we've got the young, one of the youngest uh, populations in Europe, but that's shifting uh, quite uh, quickly. Uh, gr massive growth burden of, of, of chronic disease and growing, uh, quite large in inequalities. We wanted to put that out there, and we wanted to double the amount of funding going in into population health and pu public pr health programs. Uh, so that's in the in the in the phase budget. We're focusing on entitlements, not eligibility, and we wanted to remove the financial barriers to care. Uh, in addition, we, m we move more to, we expand the solidarity model, so we, we stick with beverage, but we also need to understand that, that actually uh, our tax-based system didn't necessarily serve us that well during austerity, so uh, there are options for ring, for ring fencing and perhaps doing a bit of earmarking to supplement that beverage system so that there are sufficient resources. Um, we also realize that there's a, a good need for transitional funding, and this is something that's been, uh, been tried in, in, the, in the state of, of New York, and it's been tried in Denmark, and the NHS has been looking at it. To actually shift from one system to another, you probably need to invest in that. So you almost need to run two systems at the same time. Because you can't, you, you, you need extra money to shift a system. You can't just fund the new system. There's a transition and an investment. So if we're going to move care out of hospitals, and, and that was one of the key aims, to move care out of hospitals and into primary and community care settings, we need to build up that infrastructure there before we take the, the people out of the hospitals. Otherwise, we're going to run into chaos. So there's quite a lot of work done on, on a one-off transitional fund of about uh, $3 billion over five years uh, to, to deal with that system transfer and also to deal with the backlog of capital that hadn't been built uh, over, the, uh, over the austerity program. And actually, that's one of the areas that the capital program has been largely t taken up. Um, uh, for integrated care, we then also needed to expand the primary and social care workforce. There's, uh, we're looking at physiotherapists, occupational therapists, public health nurses. At the moment, we're, we're very medicalized. There's perhaps too much pressure on GPs uh, and on GP practices. And we uh, looked at investing in about another 6,000 into primary and social care. Geographic alignment of hospital groups and community groups, and co sorry, community health organizations, so that there could be pooled funding to purchase integrated care within a particular geographic region. Uh, and changed governance as well. Changing some of the, the, the whole issue of accountability and governance was very strong. That's been quite, uh, that's very strong in the report. It's been quite weak um, uh, in the Irish healthcare uh, s system. And then the implementation, we needed to be our own implementation. Uh, and also we spent quite a lot of time thinking about what are the stepping stones? What's the pathway to get from where we are to where we want to be? Uh, and there was quite, and we, we, we hit on six different principles of how do you expand the basket of care from where we're at to where we want to be. So we looked at quick wins. How do we build trust? How do we do things that are easy, don't require much of a system change, but help people? So lowering the drug reimbursement thresholds for single-headed households was one we could do quite quickly. It makes a, a big difference to, to some people. Um, uh, reducing the uh, drug prescription charges again, it makes a big difference, particularly to those who aren't very well off. And, and that kind of thing builds support because you need support. Um, uh, the whole issue of timing, of financing workforce uh, expansion to match entitlements, looking at uh, areas where the system, there's integrity in the system, don't change the wrong thing at the wrong time. There's got to be very careful sequencing. So 
So the hospital emergency department payment w is one of the last things to go because we don't want people going there first. We want that, that that's kind of a, a so, the, so using your, your user fee there to, 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 cr to shift people's pathways. Uh, thinking about financial affordability for government, it's all affordable within a 7% real budget increase per year. If that's not going to be feasible, we can, you, we can then rephase that, which we've also looked at as a, as a different option. Where possible, the committee wanted it free at the point of delivery. Uh, that's not always possible, though, with some of the, the, the drug costs, which are, are quite high. And then thinking about how do you phase meaningfully, usually by age or by means, so that, so that each stage of the phasing is useful in itself. Um, so we looked at different, uh, different ways of, of expanding it. So what's been, been the response? Well, one of my, uh, well, actually, I, I, I wouldn't say I would be a particular Terry Pratchett fan, uh, but he's wrote, written lots of books about Discworld, uh, and sort of sci-fi comedy, if, you, if you're into that. And uh, one of his books was called Guards, Guards. And uh, it's very interesting in it. Um, one of the, notice, the things that I noticed about it was uh, the, the predicament of being a guard. If there's trouble, you can't, uh, y you mustn't go too quickly. You mustn't rush too quickly towards it because then you'll have to sort the problem out. <laughs> On the other hand, you can't do nothing because if you do nothing, people get cross with you. So what you have to do is hurry slowly towards a problem and then hopefully it's kind of largely gone away <laughs> so there's been a bit of government policy which is resembled a little bit of guards guards which is rushing slowly towards the problem and hoping it won't it'll go away uh, and that as I say maybe that's something to do with the the, the, um, uh, the Department of Health perhaps not not feeling uh, as happy as it could be with uh, its role in the process and um, there's been an interesting battle for implementation where this launch care report was produced in May 2017, but it took uh, 15 months to get an implementation office up and running and a vague implementation plan in place. And that implementation plan, although it does have some good things in it, it also doesn't talk about entitlements. It still talks about el eligibility, and this we have pointed out. It doesn't really talk about specifics year by year and it, what, one of the bigger missions is it doesn't talk about the expansion of primary and community care staffing, which is absolutely critical for the new system to work. Well, how does the budget look then? Well, for this year, only 20 or 30% of what we asked for. Now, some of the capital is in there, which is good, but actually the rollout of free GP care, we had suggested 500,000 people, and we reckoned that was just about doable, but actually only enough money for 100,000. So what we can see is perhaps, uh, if you like, uh, over on the left there, a little bit of a watering down of this, maybe a slowing down, a watering down. Um, now, that, would be o uh, that could be okay, because it's probable that an election is in the offing, except there is one thing that is stopping an, an election uh, right now, And um, it is, it's the reason that the election isn't going a, a, ahead. And um, fortunately though, we, uh, I got an, an inside track on Theresa May's negotiating strategy with the, with the uh, European Commission just now. We've just received a letter that she wrote, it's just been put out uh, on, on Twitter. And this is her, her letter. I'm not, I'm not very good at French, but even I, I can read that. <laughs> um, so, really, anyway, um, so I must admit, I'm a bit like this car, the, the car in the Toronto snow. I'm not very amused, I'm not very amused by Brexit, full stop, but I'm also slightly concerned because maybe it's glass half empty, glass half full. We are getting some progress, but we're not quite getting the progress that I would like, and we're slightly stuck in the slow churn cement mixer here, which is uh, difficult. Um, I, uh, there we go. <laughs> I, 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 of, course, of course, I knew that uh, Pro Professor Tui would be in the audience, so, uh, and Greg uh, tipped me off. 
So I, I decided to look at her latest book uh, and to try and fit Sloan Care within that, that, that paradigm. Uh, and what uh, uh, Professor Tui looks at is, is, is this, he presents this four quadrant diagram looking at, if you like, the, uh, the scale uh, and, 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 the, and the kind of pace of, of, of different reforms. So with the Big Bang, it's huge and it all happens at the same time, whereas with the incremental one, it's gradual and it's kind of like small scale stuff. So, so, um, uh, so I think that was quite an, an interesting blueprint to, to, to use and my, apologize to, uh, my apologies to her if I'm making a complete mess of this. I'm trying to do my best here. Um, so you can fill, it, fill me in and correct me later. Uh, but there we have the representations of the different reforms done in different countries. Um, so what I decided to do was I thought I'd drop Ireland into the middle of this and there she goes. <laughs> so I probably thought she's a blueprint uh, reform. Slonchka is, a, is a, blueprint, uh, a blueprint reform because it is quite big. There's a lot going on in it. There's a lot of different parts. But it's actually, it needs to be phased. So it's not all happening at once. In fact, the phasing is one of the critical components that makes it feasible. So it's probably, you know, it's, it's not, um, it's, it's, it's big, but it's slow and steady or, or something like that. Uh, but interesting, what, what we note, perhaps from um, the Ministry of Finance, as evidenced in the budget, is the tendency to want to make it even slower by not giving all the money that we need. And perhaps in the... Uh, Department of Health, there's a tendency to make it even smaller because some of the things that we want in, like the entitlements thing, there's obviously um, a big issue there, is not coming through too. So, so there's quite a, there's, there's a tricky balance going on there. So, so anyway, that's uh, my interpretation of that. Um, anyway, you, uh, you probably know this quote. Um, <laughs> apparently these are called Trumpkins. And I really want one. <laughs> so if anyone would do me, I, I actually, I've actually asked uh, my, my colleagues to get me a trumpkin. No one's done it yet, done it yet. So I'm, I'm a bit, a bit d disappointed. But my, my concern, my concern is that, that we start to become trumpkins. Okay, that we say, oh, it's all too difficult. It's all too complicated. It's too much. We can't possibly do this. And um, I think that would be such a shame in this unique situation where we have a coherent plan. Uh, and I think it's a lesson to us all. That we can always say you can't, it can't be done. But who would have thought in Ireland, so far away from universal health care, with so many problems, that you could forge a political consensus and a coherent plan around this? Who would have thought? And yet it can be done if the leadership is there, if you take the opportunities that you're given. So I, um, I like this quote. Uh, I, was, I turned 50 last year and, and colleagues of mine gave me this quote uh, on part of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, a picture. You see things and you say, why? But I dream things that never were. Uh, and I say, why not? And I think that should always be our attitude and motto. Why not? There are enough naysayers out there, but reform does happen. It does happen, uh, good uh, reform gets done and gets through, and we need to be bringing all our skills and evidence uh, to, to the table so that we can actually make a, a difference. And um, on that, I will finish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that wonderful lecture, Stephen. I think that we have a, a great deal to contemplate here, and uh, this is actually a very good start. We're very lucky to live in this highly decentralized federation because we have this conversation going on in 13 jurisdictions within our country all of the time. So uh, it's a very rich conversation, I can tell you. And uh, 
What's very, very helpful though is to get an example from outside of the country that we can contemplate. And, and this is a reform that is, uh, you know, occurring in very unpromising circumstances. And the kinds of situations that we deal with in this country are not nearly as dire as the ones faced by Ireland in the last few years. So if Ireland can, uh, in a sense, uh, engage in this major blueprint reform, we can surely do a few things in this country. So thank you very much for that. Um, it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce the panelists and uh, I'm going to ask each panelist if they would like to make some opening comments to do so for a few minutes, up to five minutes, and then we're gonna open it up to the floor to all of you to ask whatever questions you'd like. I'm going to ask that you, however, take the mic. Uh, so if you're going to ask a question, please get up, walk up to the mic. Please give us a brief introduction, who you are, and then uh, I would like you to ask short questions if possible, not provide your own discourse, but to ask an honest question. Um, first, let me uh, introduce you to the panel and then I'll turn it over to the panel. Uh, to my immediate right here is Carolyn Tuohy, and she is a professor emeritus of political science as well as the founding fellow in public policy at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy here at the University of Toronto. Uh, as you've already heard, she has just published a major book uh, called Remaking Policy, Scale, Pace, and Political Strategy in Healthcare Reform, which a number of scholars in many countries are taking note of at this time and trying to figure out sort of where they fit in terms of this very uh, new and innovative uh, way of looking at reform as to whether uh, it's Big Bang or it's in fact two new categories, uh, Mosaic uh, or it's uh, um, blueprint uh, and it's, or it's incremental. Normally we've thought of it as either, uh, in a sense, big bang or incremental, but we have these two other categories and I'm pleased to see that uh, we have perhaps one new case study uh, for the mosaic, which is wonderful because I think we are short of case examples in that area. Uh, Next panelist is uh, Ruben Devlin, who is the Special Advisor and Chair of the Premier's Council on Improving Healthcare and Ending Hallway Medicine here in Ontario. Uh, originally, and he still is, I believe, an orthopedic surgeon, uh, and he's held many positions, uh, including uh, very senior positions in the Ontario health system. Most recently, in fact, he was President and Chief Executive Officer of the Humber River hospital here in Toronto, and he did this from 1999 to 2016. Uh, our third panelist is Julie Drury. She is the inaugural chair of the Minister's Patient and Family Advisory Council for the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, she facilitates and, and provides a patient and family perspective in healthcare policy and decision-making. Uh, and has had a great deal of experience in health system navigation and all of the challenges that poses as she is the mother with a child diagnosed with a very rare disease. So on that point, I think I would like now to turn it over to the panel, perhaps starting with Professor Tui, and then moving through the panel for any opening observations in terms of what's been presented. Carolyn. We've been asked to keep our opening rem remarks short, and I will, uh, I will obey. Uh, but let me say that I'm very, very pleased to be here for a number of reasons, not least uh, the honor of having been uh, cited and credited <laughs> by, the, uh, by the main speaker tonight. Uh, and uh, indeed, this is a very interesting case, both in terms of the substance of reform and for a political scientist like me, uh, in terms of the politics. Uh, you, if you were paying close attention to the graph of scale and pace that Steve put up, uh, you will see that um, until the 
uh, glass of Guinness arrived, uh, there was one lonely unicorn in the blueprint category, which was the Dutch reforms, uh, which started in the late 80s and 20 years later culminated in something very close to the original schematic uh, that had been agreed upon. Quite a remarkable uh, process, one that it must be said took a lot longer than had initially been expected. It was expected to be five years. As I said, it turned out to be 20. And there, were some, uh, so there was some stalling along the way. So there is uh, learning uh, to be had from the Dutch experience, I think, for uh, what the Irish are trying to do now. Uh, so given that we, uh, we might now have a pair of unicorns in the, um, in the blueprint category, and given you know, how rational a blueprint policy is for a policy wonk, uh, which I also am, uh, let's hope these unicorns breed once they're there together in the blueprint <laughs> quadrant. Um, but so why would we observe uh, the Irish adopting this strategy? In the first place, uh, there are really two stages to uh, the decision to undertake major reform in healthcare. One is what we political scientists would call the opening of a window of opportunity. So uh, why did a window of opportunity open now in Ireland for major healthcare? And you really need two things. You need a party, the governing party, uh, to form the political will to take on health care for a partisan reason. It has to serve a partisan agenda. So what's in it for the government of the day in Ireland? Well, I think Steve indicated that. It's an attempt to uh, demonstrate new politics in the wake of austerity and failure to undertake health care reform uh, the first time around. This is not the, the, the first time in recent history that a major reform has been proposed in health care in Ireland. So there's a need to demonstrate that this uh, apparently weak minority government uh, actually can, through its confidence and supply arrangement, uh, adopt uh, a major reform. It's in the interest of uh, both parties in that arrangement uh, to, to do that. Um, the second uh, condition for opening a window of opportunity, in addition, in addition to there being a partisan motive, is that the uh, parties be in a sufficiently strong institutional position. Well, you would look at the Irish case now and you would say that's a weak minority government. Why do they think they uh, can um, uh, maintain a position, uh, or, or why do they think they're in a position of strength? That depends on the ability to uh, build consensus across parties and maintain that consensus. And you would expect in the current circumstance that the government would have adopted a mosaic because it would not be at all confident that it would be in a similar position, uh, even as weak as it is, and in a, pos a similar position of power uh, going into the future. Uh, but instead, they chose to take the risk of a, of a blueprint. And um, it is a risky strategy in the current circumstance. And so let's think about the conditions for, uh, the conditions that threaten it in the first place. Um, there is, first and foremost, the question of the stability of the initial coalition. Uh, and I don't just mean the confidence and supply arrangement between the two parties, but the broad coalition of parties that has agreed to this strategy. Uh, how, do, how is the stability of that coalition maintained? And then, of course, there is the risk uh, that Steve so cleverly demonstrated of the distraction of Brexit uh, and, uh, and the ongoing circle of hell that Brexit represents for, uh, for the governments affected. Um, so there's lots of risk. Uh, what can we expect about the conditions of success? It is a broad initial coalition in the first, and that's the first condition of success. This is, this is a truly broad cross-party uh, agreement. And um, if that breadth can be maintained uh, over the course of the reform, it has a, 
ha it has a good chance of success. The likelihood of maintaining that coalition of support uh, will depend on, if the Dutch case is any example, two things. One is establishing what I've called a shadow of the future so that everyone believes that this is where things are going and they start adjusting their behavior and it becomes its own implementation, as, as Steve said. Uh, but you have to establish that belief, that confidence that, that this is where we're going, we better get in line, we better adjust our behavior and be prepared for the future. Um, and the way to do that is to ensure that at, e at each step uh, in the um, enactment of the, of the policy, this is not just about implementation, this is about enactment over a period of time that extends beyond the life of the current government. At each stage, the deal has to be as balanced as the original agreement, or people will peel off. The Dutch learned this the hard way. They tilted one way, they tilted too far to the left in their first, in their second step, uh, and they stalled. You have to maintain the balance. What is it that everybody saw for themselves in this deal? Make sure that a little bit of that is there at every step. So uh, it, is, it is a risky strategy. Uh, it's not an impossible strategy, and I would just love to be able to populate that graph with one more blueprint case, so, uh, so slanche. <laughs> well, thank you very much. The, uh, and, and I, find it, I find the presentation interesting, and, and try and find some commonality to what we're looking at here in Ontario, and uh, I don't know that if misery likes company and, and, and all of this, but it, there's so many common uh, common themes as we uh, and as uh, was mentioned with 13 jurisdictions in our in Canada that uh, go through this. But I wanted to pick out uh, a couple a few points about uh, what I think were important, what I believe is important in the uh, transition. And number one is the long-term vision. And uh, I, I think that uh, that's critical to what's going on. And frequently I, I'll, I'll ask a group like this, what do you think the long-term vision for healthcare is? And everybody shakes their heads and said, there is none. And so that was, that was, that's the first step in looking at, at creating a long-term vision of articulating that vision and then following it up with articulating what some of the problems are and, uh, and what that those are. So you talked about wait times. Uh, wait times are, are a problem of varying degrees and uh, we, uh, we grapple with that as well and, uh, and put that there. Health and wellness and uh, looking at that as, as to how we, we, we push those agendas because there's, there's as we see it, there's short-term strategies and long-term strategies. We talked about evidence-based, so that it's um, it can't it has to be what's uh, what's important. I and there, I, you talked about entitlement. Uh, more often, we talk about it as a right, and uh, and that healthcare is there that it's and that it's integrated, and and that's what we heard from 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 Ontarians that uh, they wanted an integrated system system that that moved ease that they could move easily so those those were some some key points but i would i would say that number 1 on my list is uh, implementation and that there's lots there's lots of good work done that has dust on it and it's the implementation plans that that are critical to there, and and therefore, and also to to add part of the implementation plan, having metrics that show what you've done to do that. One of the things, uh, and our systems are different, uh, and I can hear that. I I know that uh, some of the discussion that we're going to have in Canada in the upcoming months is that about drugs and how that's done, and so there's. There's some differences, but it, not every system has to be identical. The only one that I 
that we have focused on, and uh, I, I'm not sure I heard you articulate that, was that about patient and family-centered care and how that, uh, that changes the decisions that we make I as we move forward. So uh, as we look at what goes on in each individual area, there's lots of great care that goes on in our health care system, but they don't, they don't connect to each other. They're, they're often institutional-based or provider-based. The decisions on how to set up the system are not patient-centered, and so those are some of the challenges that, that, uh, that we see as we move forward in, in the transformation process in Ontario. So thank you. Thank you. So first of all, it's a pleasure to be uh, amongst this company, and I think it's a, a huge credit to, to um, Sustaini and, and the leadership of the Foam Lecture Series to have a patient partner at this table and speaking with um, persons like Carolyn and Dr. Devlin and, and Steve, um, um, pleasure to be here. Um, so some reflections on, on your presentation, and one was I was waiting for the slide of, of the patients and the public. And the slide that I saw was that gentleman holding up the sign saying, we need change, we're suffering, we're hurting, this system is not working for us. And I think that's where patient partnership and public engagement has really stemmed from when it comes to the healthcare system is that, that voice, that advocacy, that this system is not working for us. We can't navigate it. We can't coordinate our care. We are running around creating dozens of binders to manage our health information when we've got this technology at our disposal. And this is the, the binder that I developed to navigate the emergency department with my daughter when she was alive. And uh, it was essential because information was not available uh, to the care practitioners at any institution that we might show up to. Don't let me forget this, by the way. <laughs> it's a brick. I've been carrying it around Toronto all day. <laughs> The other thing that I noticed was um, the impact of what was happening in Ireland to families and patients. Look at those inpatient stays. Look at the burden that was placed on patients in the system and on the families and the caregivers who were, who were pressured not only financially, but I can just imagine the burden of care in their own households to manage their loved ones and to make decisions as well whether or not do I go to the doctor or do I not? Do I go to the emergency department or do I not? Can I afford that fee? So imagine that burden and that impact. Um, the other thing that I'm thinking through is I'm wondering how that transition, how that blueprint was connected with um, patient, family, and caregiver advisors. And if there was a plan around that blueprint and if you had patient advisors sitting in on those workshops to engage in how the healthcare system was working for them, what the challenges and barriers were, what the solutions and drivers might be. Um, and not only that, but then communicating out this is how this is going to change in Ireland, this is how it's going to be implemented or ruled out, and this is how it's going to be affecting uh, you as a patient and or your family. You know, here in Ontario, uh, I would put forward uh, that we are leaders in Canada when it comes to patient engagement. We are the only province in this country that has an embedded ministerial patient and family advisory council, a person who advises the minister, who advise, advises the deputy minister, who speaks to senior leadership about not just the patient experience, but this culture shift that we're experiencing as a province towards stronger engagement and moving towards partnership. We're talking a lot about patient-centered care, which is important, focusing on, on the patient, what their outcomes and experiences are, but what patient and families really want is partnership. We want to be involved in shared decision making. We want real-time access to our health information. We want to help build up the healthcare systems that are going to work for everyone. Recently, I was offering a talk at the University of Ottawa, and I was, I was moving towards the building where I was going to offer a lecture, and there was this really beautiful, paved, meandering path. And uh, obviously someone who had built the building thought, well, this will be a nice aesthetic to, to add, right? Not just this straight concrete pathway, but something beautiful with shrubbery. And you know what was actually, what people were actually using? The pathway across the grass to get from the road to the door. Because people wanted to get access to the building and get where they needed to go. Patients and families and caregivers are the expert hackers of the healthcare system. 
So while you're building policy and initiatives and structures and blueprints and matrices and whatever it might be, there is a well, a depth and a breadth of knowledge there that is untapped, a data source, metrics, whatever you want to call it, that we are not yet mining. And these are the people who are hacking the healthcare system and figuring out how to use it in the most efficient and effective way. And we're just nudging the edge of gaining that information and being able to pull it into our healthcare system design and thinking. So I'm excited for you in Ireland. I'm hoping that you are looking at that role of patient partnership. We're doing it in Ontario. Um, it's a marathon. And I know because I'm a runner and when I hit 36 kilometers, I'm ready to absolutely pull out of that race. But I'm pushing through as a patient and family advisor and I'm wearing down uh, senior leadership or maybe bringing them into my mindset and my fold that there is a real opportunity here to not just hear about lived experience and, um, and, and hear the inspirational stories or the tough stories, but to actually partner together so we can shift the healthcare system. all three for this uh, wonderful comment. Stephen, uh, we can give you at least three or four minutes to respond right now if you'd like to any of the observations, uh, particularly uh, the fact that I think you're about kilometer 12 of that 36 kilometer race or so in Ireland right now. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. Those are all really fascinating, really good um, insights. Um, I'll start with the, the patients and the public stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think we are not at the races compared to where you are. Uh, I think there was some discussion of whether we need a citizens' assembly to discuss and debate this. Like we had that with the uh, with the um, design of the uh, referendum around abortion, which worked quite well. Um, and whether we need something similar to that, um, I think that's I, I, I think um, that's really important. And there, was a, there has been some debate uh, around how exactly th that could be done. Um, so let's see where that goes. Th Ireland is slowly getting there with this uh, issue. It's becoming more and more and more important, and it's becoming more of the, re of the architecture of evidence creation now, uh, which is great too. Um, I think one of the things that I didn't talk about actually was, was information flow to patients. I mean, one of the, one of the key things why waiting times are so long is there's such a lack of clarity about performance in the system and and um uh and i think one of one of the key things that the, 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 the there's a lot of money g will be going into is much better information and systems whereby people can access data to know exactly what's going on what kind of barriers they have to face where the waiting, the problems with waiting times are, who the, the, the particular culprits are. And that's taken a lot of, of unearthing by, by investigative journalists to do that, uh, about some of the practices that are going on which aren't, which aren't um, ethical and this, they're probably not legal either. Um, some of the dual practice activities uh, that are, are, g are going on. So, so I think we're going there, we're getting there and, and it, there is money in the plan for that we're still a long way short of, of having what you say here, mm -hmm. but I think it's, uh, I really take that on board. I say. I'll come over and help you. Please, do that. <laughs> that would be great. Um, I would just say, um, uh, I think on uh, Ruben's point, I think there's, there's a, a very interesting um, issue about short-term versus long-term, which, which we're, we're, really, we're really aware in doing it that a lot of these things are a lot of the change required is deeply structural and you can only move as fast usually as your human resources allow you mm -hmm. to. That's the slowest thing that usually acts as the constraint. But therefore, you have to provide cover for those long, deep changes that need to happen with things that you can pick off quite quickly in the first few years. So I, th I think the design is managing those, I'm obviously making a change, whilst also getting the structural stuff going, which, which I mean, particularly when we're looking at training or we're looking at skill mix or we're looking at different educational formats for to allow uh, integrated care and, and team like that takes some planning. And then um, on uh, Carolyn's stuff, wow, thank you. I was writing down every word. So this is what we need to do, quick, quick, quick. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, no, you, you, we, yeah, we need to charter a plane and get everyone, <laughs> to get you all to come over. And uh, no, I thought it was really interesting about what it needs to, to, to stay going. Yeah, it, it is a risky strategy. So far, I think the political consensus is holding. As someone said, we have a plan. That's such a big step to actually have a plan. We've never had a plan before that everyone's bought into. This is a plan. And, and, and even if, if we kind of like, you know, we might be a bit of push and shove around it, at least there's something to work with. And that still is there. So that's a couple of years on, so that's a good start. And my, my thinking is that if we, if we shift left at any stage, we'll probably um, get equal support to, to Slanche Care. Because, I mean, people have, have signed up for it at this stage. So I'm confident for now, but uh, I, yeah, I hear those risks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I should emphasize uh, Steve's special role, which he was quite modest in uh, setting out, but he was the chief advisor as, uh, when the, uh, his Center for Health Policy uh, uh, and Management was called upon at the university, uh, which is uh, basically uh, unusual for an academic unit to be asked to provide that kind of advice and support in the development of a long-term care plan and it's I think most of you in this audience are connected to the Academy in some way uh, that rarely happens in the Canadian context but I think there is opportunity for that to happen in the future so let's turn it over now to you if you could please get up and uh, uh, provide your question at the mic Oh, we have a stampede all of a sudden. Yeah. Wow. Oh my God. A bit more than I expected. <laughs> there were about three people that got up on this side so quickly. Uh, so, but please uh, introduce yourself very quickly and, and keep your questions as short as possible. Make sure they really are questions. Thank you. Also a marathoner uh, like Julie, so I can get here quickly. My question is actually targeted both for Stephen and for Dr. Devlin. And I guess, Stephen, um, thank you very much for your talk and for making the trip here in the middle of winter. Um, I guess relative to the conversation you shared with us, you mentioned the focus was entitlement uh, to universal health care and the basically elimination of eligibility and uh, financial barriers to that universal care. But concurrent to that, you have a slide that talks about increased private care. And so I'm wondering who decided what private care how that was decided, and then I guess Dr. Devlin, where I'm interested in how this fits in the Ontario model in terms of some of the transformation that's underway. Okay. Um, Is that too heavy? Yeah, no, no I'm, I'm just trying to think about the, you said that I had a slide which showed increased private care, so I could, I just can't remember that. What was, what precisely did it say? I think it was where you were talking about um, sort of the, I think in that same slide where you talked about the entitlement and the um, no eligibility and yeah. uh, and no financial barriers and underneath that more private care, which I kind of saw as a bit of an oxymoron, maybe not, but I'm curious as to how you can explain that. Maybe I misread the slide. Okay, okay. I'm just going to have a quick uh, check I don't now the time on that one. Yeah, I think... Um, just trying to see, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, while well, you're finding that, I didn't introduce myself, the, so I, I didn't catch sorry. the first part, yeah. which is Patricia Sullivan Taylor. Well, any other panelists can jump in at this yeah. point, too, you know? So uh, please. I, I think that you, you asked how this relates to our transformation, and, <coughs> and the transformation proposed in Ontario is about improving the public, publicly funded system, and it was to, to look at 42% of uh, every dollar is spent on health care, we have uh, an impending challenge with an aging population and how, how can we best organize health care within our, the communities across the uh, province, but specifically improving the delivery of a publicly funded system. I found the slide. Okay, <laughs> got it. Fine, sorry about that. Yeah, actually what we talk about is moving the private care out of the public hospitals. So, so what we're doing is, is, and actually that's the one thing I didn't talk about, I must have just have skipped uh, over that point. And that's been a very contentious thing. Uh, and the, the idea is that to, to be fair to people, we shouldn't be allowing people to pay their way 
back into the public system through the private insurance so that they should everyone should be on an equal playing field now if people want to go and use private care and, and private insurance in private facilities they're that they can do that we're not we're not saying that that's banned so that's uh, you know but we are saying that at the moment the system is is in inherently unfair and that we, we we don't want people jumping the queue just according to their insurance status so i, I c i'm sorry that i didn't explain that point Thank more fully you. Perhaps we'll switch to the other side. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Van Osten. I'm an MHI grad from the IHPME. Um, and uh, I designed and developed uh, digital health solutions at Mohawk College in Hamilton. My question, uh, I suspect, would be most applicable to Dr. Tui. Uh, both of the unicorns um, use systems that are not first past the post. And here in Ontario and in Canada, Apparently, we are addicted to first past the post and can't break the habit, uh, despite having tried a couple times. Um, so the question is, should we be hopeful? Um, is the sort of grand transformational changes that we've seen in those uh, unicorn instances, is that possible in an increasingly partisan uh, nation and, and province where you know, left and right tend to vilify each other rather than work across the, across the aisle? Um, and I'm not pointing specifically to the to the current um, uh, government. Uh, it's it's happening all over the place here in North America, and, and particularly in first past the post jurisdictions. So my question, Dr. Tui, is there a, is there a solution for big, long term, 15 year plans, blueprints, actually having any success at all, when each government revokes the work of the previous? Um, uh, how does one do that, or do we have to abandon hope? for change and try to fix first past the post first. Or is that too simple? I don't know. So if I were going to uh, locate Ontario on, on that graph, uh, or the, the likelihood that Ontario would appear on that graph, uh, I don't think it is likely that it would. Um, these these are cases in which a window of opportunity for major change in the health system uh, occurred. Um, and by major change, I mean changes in the fundamental organizing principles of the system. What's the role of government? Well, who's entitled to what? Ch uh, changes in the, in the power balance of the system. What's the relative power of, of health care providers versus government? for example, versus private finance. Um, I don't see that in, I don't see any party in Ontario, uh, now or in the foreseeable future, embracing change along those fundamental dimensions of the system. I think, as Ruben says, what we're seeing now is improving delivery within the publicly funded system, which is eminently sensible, um, but which is not a, a major change in the system. Um, so I, I, I think what, we, what we're likely to be in in Ontario for the foreseeable future is uh, what I would call as a political scientist the politics of normal times uh, and finding the opportunities within the politics of normal times to move the system forward but not to change its fundamental parameters. I don't see the appetite for that really, uh, really anywhere amongst the, it, within the political system. Next question, please. Yeah, Roxana Sultan, Executive Director of the Provincial Council for Maternal and Child Health. And I was delighted to hear uh, Dr. Devlin speak about a long-term view on the health system reform and health system improvement. And coming from the pediatric perspective, I can say there's no better bang for buck than investment in pediatrics and, and making sure that we uh, provide the high quality uh, supports and services that, that young people need to have healthy lives in the future. Um, but as we think as health system planners, we tend to focus on the silver tsunami and the aging population. So I'm wondering if the panel has any thoughts about how we can ensure that we embed that perspective of pediatric um, and early uh, uh, continuum support into our health system planning. And if you have any advice to policy planners like us in terms of how best to move that forward. Well, let me, uh, <coughs> let me hop in here and say uh, this, 
that, when you talk about the, the pediatric age group, that's where we can stock, talk, start talking about uh, long-term planning and in the, the whole system and start to affect some of the, the factors that change and depending on what age that we're going to get at them. So when does, um, when does healthcare policy integrate with social policy and educational policy uh, that makes a difference to your, to the healthcare that's being, that's of your, of your citizens that affects it 20 and 30 years down the line. And so that, yes, so we've got to, there's two, com you know, basically two components to that. One, taking care of the, the pediatric age group for urgent issues, and that, uh, that we do pretty well. And so that if you have an urgent problem, we need to, uh, on, a, on a transactional basis, we do it very well. We need to integrate it better and be more patient and family centered. But on the long term, trying to create the, the, the environment for the wellness of the community and the education and the time to, to get at that is when, when these people are very young and continue it through, through their lifetime. So I think those are the big changes that you can, that you can affect. Um, hi, Roxana. So I know each other from working together. Uh, so I think the, the, the key phrase for me with um, pediatrics, and that's my area of knowledge as a medical mom, is uh, that children are not many adults. And uh, we treat them as such in the healthcare system, unfortunately. We need to be treating them as a specific population, and I'm hoping that's something that we'll see as we move towards uh, transformation in the healthcare system here in Ontario. Um, we also have a small population. Uh, and relative to the adult population, the gray tsunami that's coming, other pressures that we have in the system. And so I think, and Dr. Devlin would probably like this comment, I think we can leverage some of the really interesting supports that are out there from a virtual care point of view to offer that specialized care to rural and remote communities, communities where they need um, um, specialty care or, or um, consults that um, families can't necessarily access in their communities because they're not in Ottawa next to CHEO or they're not in Toronto next to Sick Kids or London Health Sciences or what have you, those major pediatric centers that we have in the province. Um, I think we've got an uh, amazing model, and I'll give a shout out to Roxanne and her team in Complex Care Kids Ontario, which is a really demonstrative model of, uh, of a program where there's specialization um, that is centered in the two major, major pediatric centers and that have hub sites across the province that offer that virtual care option and support families to be in their communities. Um, I think the other thing we have to be conscious of when it comes to pediatrics that is uh, not anything that's gonna shock anyone in this room, but the transitioning care from pediatrics to adult is a chasm. It's the Grand Canyon of healthcare right now, um, amongst other things, and you fall off the cliff and literally have to reboot yourself over about a year or two from being a child to entering the adult system and completely changing over your, your, your uh, caregiver supports. that I was referring to, it, uh, we will have to watch what bubbles up uh, in the uh, integrated care teams uh, proposals in, in Ontario, mm -hmm. and there may well be some uh, innovations and surprises there that will um, <coughs> begin to expand out the, uh, the scope of uh, beyond, beyond strictly health care delivery into areas of social care. Okay, next uh, question over here. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Seng Shin Young. I'm doing uh, uh, government relations, but I'm also interested in about the digital health. And my question direct to Dr. Devlin, and my question is, uh, I hear someone from the Ontario Brain Institute, and she's saying about those, it takes too long to aggregate all the like, uh, neuro, like surgical data across the, all the hospitals. So do you think it's time for government sort of have a mandate to build a, some framework for the like a privacy and the, the collecting uh, aggregate <coughs> data like uh, among all those our health institutions? So, so let, me, let me just rephrase because uh, the acoustics in this room are not the best. <laughs> Is so, uh, so that I thought it was just the silver age here that <laughs> that was the problem. The, 
so I, I think what you're saying is, is this a time to aggregate some of the data yeah. and with regard to the privacy? Like making some of the rules fair. Is it fair to the, the, the hospitals providing the data, but also at the same time that the institutes that want to have the aggregate like the data fair? Because she, she was, I think, directly at the, the interested in. She was saying not just sharing the data, but just come up with an agreement among all the hospitals, which is like a three years. She thinks this is like really ridiculous. That, that should take just a year or a year and a half. Like, should be done that, you know? So there's a there's a couple of perspectives on uh, on digital health, and and that's a huge topic that that I can certainly talk for for a long time on. But specifically to your question, uh, I divide it into two components. One that affects directly the patient care, and and the patient has uh, has the the right to, ha to have access to their data at all times. And one of, the, one of the little obstacles that we have right now to doing that is the, uh, is the current privacy legislation because it was, it was created at a different time and we need to accommodate it to today's, today's days. So that, so that one of the, the, initi uh, the initiatives in our transformation agenda is to create these Ontario health teams which bring together different providers to make integrated care. One of the, one of the challenges is, um, is that this in, the, in order to make it successful, the informa patient information needs to flow through the entire system. So that we're gonna, we're gonna have to look at it and make sure that that information is able to flow because if we're going to have care that is seamless, the healthcare record has to be moving with the patient and not be institutional based. The second component, and probably one of the more exciting components of healthcare, is, is uh, predictive analytics and, and AI that we need to be able to share anonymized data throughout our researchers and to allow people to use that data so that we ha we so that we really make value for that and that uh, that as well has some challenges with the current system and I think we need to to look at that as well so thank you for that question thank you and I know of others okay we're well over time so I've been uh, told to uh, basically bring this to an end with one final question on this side I know that you've been waiting some time and I apologize to everyone else, but I'm sure you'll have an opportunity to ask the question at the reception. So please go ahead. Morgan, former chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine, University of Toronto, and for our keynote speaker, Dr. Thomas. Uh, in, in your project in Ireland, um, how, how do patients connect with a primary care physician, a GP or a family physician, and how is that doctor paid? And secondly, do they need to see that doctor before they, in your plan, do they need to see that physician before they see a consultant specialist or can they go directly? Uh, okay, fine, sure. They, um, they, uh, if they are private patients, uh, so that's people without the medical card or, or a GP visit card, they can, they can either walk in and do same day sit and wait uh, and then see their GP or they can make an appointment they get seen usually within a day or two. Um, uh, if they're private patients, they just pay the 50 or 60 euro. If they're medical card or, or they have a free GP visit card, they are paid by the government, the primary care reimbursement service, which, which uh, contracts whole lists of medical card patients to GPs for different areas. So that's how, how um, that they're paid. In terms of uh, GEPs are meant to be the gatekeepers, so you 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 cannot uh, you cannot see a consultant without getting a referral from a GP. Um, so it, the system is meant to act as a as a, as a as a sort of with a, a, a gatekeeping thing. Um, however, the the referral is almost automatic in many cases. So it it rather than keeping people away, it actually just tends to be another layer of bureaucracy that people have to go through. But technically, they should be gatekeepers. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, it's my great pleasure to be able to 
thank uh, the key people here, but uh, I'll start with Staney Brown and the Dalalana School of Public Health for sponsoring this great event, to Les Bohm for uh, his generous support and vision in terms of this lecture series, our panel members, Carolyn Tui, Reuven Devlin, and Julie Drury, thank you very much. And finally, I would like to thank Stephen Thomas for joining us today, for coming from Dublin and uh, explaining his, uh, his uh, experiences in terms of the Irish health system. Uh, we've had some discussions in the past at various European observatory meetings, and uh, the story is quite a remarkable one, and I'm happy that we've had the opportunity to, to hear all about it. So uh, would you please join me in thanking our guest speaker and our panelists. Please join us for the reception just outside as well.